Welcome to Sarfati Science Seminar's Cortona 2023 event. It's May 22nd, and today's speakers include John Warner, Robert Adenall, and Dr. Jack Sarfati. I'm your moderator, Tim Ventura, and we'll begin with the discussion by John Warner. The history of all this. It, it, it goes back from my lifetime of study. It goes back to day one of, of the creation of the Earth. Um, someone said that the Earth might be a couple billion years older than we're told, six billion, uh, give or take a billion. I don't know. I don't. But uh, one would think that this is a, being a garden planet with lots of water, both fresh and salt. And it's going to attract people from all over the place doing whatever they want to do, whether it be botany or, you know, genetic animal uh, studies or, you know, you create a race in a lab and, and it's like, well, let's see how it does on the earth, you know. And, um, you know, it went from there. I think, uh, personally, I think ET involvement goes back uh, probably a couple billion years when the planet cooled and and uh, started doing life. They were like, ooh, let's plant the palm tree, you know, and oh, let's do the, you know, monitor lizard or whatever. And so I think this... Uh, Earth has been Grand Central Station for a long time. We, the human race, seems to be around for half a million years, give or take. Um, I kind of lean towards the the idea that we were created in a lab. Uh, there's no missing link. There never was. Proto-humans, Australopithecus, Neanderthals, they're not Homo sapiens. And Neanderthals have bigger brains than we do, but they're not capable uh, as far as we know they weren't capable of consciousness higher thought reasoning uh, creativity so other than you know making some flint tools and spears clovis points um so that's where i i lean into this i, I think if you look at the, the the renaissance art there's some intriguing paintings where there's some strange objects in the sky um i think the renaissance uh the roman empire is you know coming from sumeria let's just talk about the last twelve thousand five hundred years since the great flood and the younger dryas generally speaking um gobleki tepe i think they've dated it to twelve thousand five hundred years old that was a game changer because it doubled human history and it gives more credence to the idea that uh you know like graham hancock uh i'm a big fan of his um, that pre-Diluvian high civilizations were rife and um, that they weren't just myths. Uh, if you do the digging, you know, it, some of them go back, you know, as far as, you know, your imagination can go. And so natural disasters, uh, wars, other things demolish that. But since the Roman Empire, um, there was some, a whole lot of consciousness awakening, but I think the Renaissance was. Uh, da Vinci has a great quote. He says, I awoke only to find the rest of the world asleep. And I think that that carries over to today because those of us who have awakened, not that we're better than anyone else, but those of us who have truly awakened to some of these possibilities in science and, and uh, you know, the ufology and, uh, and on my big thing, which is alternative history, you know, what really happened because history's written by the winners and popes and royals. And that's a little tainted. So um, I think it, it builds. A, and then the second thing was the age of reason. Um, I think the secret societies were really going strong then, not just the Freemasons, but, you know, everyone, all of them. And they were keeping alive the Egyptian mystery school information. And and, and I just written a, a, a document with the photos and illustrations what I think compromises the Holy Grail, which is a cup of knowledge um, that's been passed down from secret society to you know lay people or whatever. Um, but it's getting fairly clear to what that was. You know, obviously we're not alone in the universe. You know, creation, the cosmos has a feminine vibration, consciousness, uh, matter, plasma. Um, you know, all the things that constitute our cosmos, universe, and reality. So metaphysics, theosophy, all that stuff is all wound in there. Philosophy, uh, physics. Uh, there's a great quote, I think, from uh, Max Planck. I could be wrong. He said that 
high-end physics morphs into philosophy eventually. Um, and that makes sense to me, um, being a physics layman. Um, so the history of ET visitation and strange things in the sky and uh, strange people that are really tall or have elongated heads and all these things. If you add it all together, which is not easy, but it took me 45 years, um, a pretty clear picture emerges, not not perfect, but you know, it's like a puzzle, huge puzzle, but there's a lot of pieces missing. But you kind of sort of get the gist of what it's portraying. And I, I think that the human race, Homo sapiens, we're part of a vast galactic and universe um, of equal yet different star beings and star nations. And so that's sort of where I am. And, you know, I'm a military historian and it's like, well, history is just war, war, war. Royals did this, you know, popes, papal armies uh, attacking, you know, the Medici's. And so when you get into all that, you kind of see that that we're a very warlike race. I mean, America's day job is war preparation. I've lived it here in D.C. all my life with my dad and the Pentagon. Everything most corporations are linked to the military industrial complex. I believe Catherine Austin Fitz, uh, the economist who worked for HUD, um, I think she's probably right uh, that America's GDP is more towards 25 to 30 trillion per annum rather than the three or four we're told, three to five. And you can guess where all that goes. Um, and so that's my basic introduction. I, I think we're at a crossroads now where people of like minds uh, need to come together. You don't have to agree on everything. It, that doesn't matter. It's good that we don't agree on everything because it keeps it flexible. It's like a tailor in London making a suit. You know, all the panels of the suit are loosely sewn together. Before we tighten up all those joints and things, we need to tread carefully and go forward especially now that we have a arrow and the UAP task force and Chris Mellon shooting his mouth off and boring everyone to death. Um, you know, things like that. I, you know, I think it's very care. We go forward. We carefully tighten those strings and someday, and maybe in my grandson's lifetime, the suit will come together and it'll be a clear picture. So that's sort of where my thinking is. Yes, no. Uh, sorry, John. I, I So I let everybody unmute themselves. Um, so I, I guess what I'll do is I'll, I'll remove spotlight. Um, so anybody who has questions, just go for it. Oh, John? Go, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, John Ramirez has a question. Go for it, uh, John. Yeah, John. Um, what would you want Chris Mellon to actually admit that he knows? Uh, I get asked that a lot. And by the way, thank you for coming forward with all your work. Um, well, I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Uh, my wife and I muse this a lot. She's former CIA uh, linguist. Um, actually smarter than me. Um, I'm not sure. We're split on whether or not Chris knows a shit ton or he's been given a very limited, thin playbook to follow. I tend to go that he's been given a limited view of this whole subject. She thinks he knows much more than he's letting on. She might be right. I think it's an amalgam of, of both our opinions. He's somewhere in the middle. But along the way, someone, I mean, he's 66, I'm 61. For him to come out of retirement and get off his yacht and, and do this, whole thing i think he feels strongly about the subject but i think he wants to take the national security sort of pentagon um view of it that it is this is a military threat which i think does have some hold some water but i think they've overblown it um mm -hmm. what would he say what would i like him to say mm -hmm. i don't think that really matters i think it's it's He's never going to say, I don't think he's ever going to get off the playbook. He's not going to go off script. Um, because I think once you pull that thread, a lot of things start to unravel. Because obviously nobody cares about talking about UFOs or abductions or sightings 
or Tic Tacs or anything. They don't care about that. I think there are groups within the military, industrial, corporate, intel complex that want to keep this in secret in perpetuity because not only does it make a lot of money, they have a lot of power. And perhaps we're doing a brisk trade with ET. I think that's true. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to disrupt that. And ET probably polarities are run the gamut, but they probably say, oh no, don't we don't want you to disclose too much, just a little. Okay. You know, Thank keep, you for that. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with you, John. Um well, I think he was given a playbook, but he actually knows more of the plays than what he's calling, if you get that sports analogy. So the playbook is like really thick. And he's being told, okay, now you're going to run these plays now. And I think all of the principals, uh, such as Jim Simivan and Lou Elizondo, both of whom I've met personally, I've, I never met your cousin Chris, um, and I met Jay Stratton. Um, they're all given playbooks like that. Um, but I think the time now is that, you know, they're expanding it. They're expanding what they can say. And um, I'm steadfast going to say that Come this fall of 2023, there will be a major event, whether you call it a disclosure event, I don't care what name it's given, but I think a lot of these principles and a lot of people that most of us don't know who've been working on this will come forward and say, yeah, it's we know what's flying and we know it's non-human. And I think that's the mission that the government will give later on this year. And we're hoping that other folks would then say, well, how do you know they're non-human? And then open up that discussion and do you know about anything how they fly and open up that discussion uh because we're going to keep those triangles in the hangar and under the ground you know wherever they store those triangles um they're not like they don't do warp drive they're more cis lunar kind of vehicles um they're uh, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance vehicles um they're l dynamic shape and you don't need that triangle shape to fly in space but they do need to fly in aerospace and that's why they're shaped like that. And um, I, I don't think they'll ever reveal what we have. And I know they have something, but I don't think they will reveal it, but anything else that is not human. And I don't mean extraterrestrial because um, I believe they've been here a lot longer than humanity has been on this planet and it's their planet. And we're sort of like the recent arrivals. And as to your point, John, we were upgraded uh, by however means. I, I think all of that might start coming out. So that's that's my hope. And that's why I came forward with like what little I know. And I was given a smaller playbook, at least to introduce that, because um, I came out in 2021. And um, but I've been a around since 2020. I let my presence known in that circle. And so they're encouraging me to say certain things. And so everything I say, I sent back up to the agency and they came back saying, okay, yeah, it's unclassified now, go ahead and say it, but we're not gonna endorse anything you say. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of people speaking out. We just know a little sliver. And uh, so we'll see what happens, John, but uh, thanks very much for your work, by the way. Great book. <laughs> Drink a beer. Um, and um, I, I just want to throw one thing out, and I'm not—I know I'm not a, a guest speaker or anything, but um, you wrote about thorium in your book. Yes. And I happen to know there is a gentleman who um, came forward and sort of talked to a film producer by the name of uh, James Fox, and he did the uh, Brazil film. And um, he 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 was known. He was actually known in that circle. And he kept changing his story. But one thing he did say was that thorium was part of the fuel or however they're using thorium, that some of the craft need thorium. And I found that to be very unusual because um, I don't know anything about thorium. I don't know anything about nuclear physics or anything like that. Um, me, I was just a political science guy. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know all that. I don't know why I know what I know, but um, thorium is out there um, in that inner circle. And uh, when you wrote about it, I just 
fell off my seat, you know, basically. Because I think some of the things that we saw earlier were extensions of craft that we were able to finish that the Germans were not because we bombed the crap out of their industrial base. And we actually finished some of the craft. And what some of the stuff that we're flying was like German technology. Um, the fact that it's saucer shaped, um, we're not seeing too many saucer shapes now. Uh, but that earlier craft may have been of German technology, and they wanted to hide the fact that we were working with, like, by golly, you know, car carrying Nazis who were still Nazis that we work with. And, um, you know, they helped CIA set up the national security state. But um, that's why I, lo I love your work, John because you that's the part where cia hiccuped when i sent them my presentations and i always tell cia what i'm going to talk about and they were very uncomfortable of connecting anything to do with this topic and germans nazis yeah very uncomfortable about that yes um i'll answer uh, those are all very good points um are they disclosing more as chris mellon and everything a little we're all of a certain age. We remember Project Blue Book. They're not really telling us anything much different, a little different, slightly, than Project Blue Book back in the 70s. So I just wanted to say that. Um, I got that story from J.P. Farrell, Joseph P. Farrell. He said, and I, I researched it, and it's correct, that the, the Nazi SS were scouring all over the Middle East and other places because Europe didn't have high quality thorium. Thorium isotope is needed in free energy research. So if you have a, a torsion field, electromagnetic, you know, high voltage plasma accelerator, the red mercury in the counter rotating drums, uh, I think it has beryllium, I, I don't know, maybe U-235, not sure. They had uh, uranium in the Sudetenland, but they got the thorium supposedly from the Middle East, Egypt, Another reason why Rommel and everyone, they were after the oil, but it was also rare earth minerals and thorium um, to do this project because uh, they, they really need, Germany needed to get off fossil fuels. They, they were making, to make coal into an, uh, a fuel, it was extremely expensive and costly. And so they were really sucking wind for energy and, you know, free energy would have worked for them. But the byproduct of that is if you have a plasma accelerator in the center of a disk aircraft, um, you'd get some mass reduction in that. So that's where the thorium idea comes from. But I researched it and I was like, by golly, it's hard to find. But in the German archives, I found they were like, oh, they were looking for, you know, rare earth minerals, all everything under the sun in Egypt, Northern Africa. And they, they were in Iraq in 1940. People don't know that. The British threw them out in 41, but they were only there for a year or two. But who knows, in the 30s, the Annan Air Bay and the SS, they did all kinds of expeditions. And we have just a few books detailing what they were really digging. So I think my thorium idea in the mine in the book you're reading, I think it was pretty much on target. Um, they desperately needed that and everything else they could find. Yeah, they, they, no one wants to talk about the Germans. I find that very interesting. What's Operation High Jump all about? If the base two, we know base 211 was a real thing in Antarctica. You know, Gehring and Hess sponsored the original missions. Admiral Byrd was supposedly, had gone down there in the 30s as an advisor. We didn't know we were going to fight the Germans. And so, yes, Nazis flying discs, uh, Antarctica bases, it's, it's silly. The Hollywood makes fun of it. Movies, Iron Sky. But I wonder if they're making fun of it to derail it because Operation High Jump makes no sense. Uh, why not test your Arctic gear and things in the Bering Sea close to Alaska? No, no, they went all the way down there with probably 10,000 Marines. And the word is they got aircraft shot down and a, a ship was sunk. And, you know, there's all these stories, but that's a very strange bit of history. There's a U.S. Navy film on it. So, intriguing. Go to Jack. Yeah, and, and again, uh, so the, I, 
uh, I have it set so that you guys can unmute yourselves. Uh, Jack, do you want to go? Can you hear me now? Absolutely. Okay. I, I want to just correct uh, John Warner on a point of physics. It's not mass reduction. Whenever people talk about mass reduction, they don't understand the physics. It yeah. may be weight reduction, but weight is oh, mass that's times the, uh, the, the gravity field. What they're doing is canceling the gravity field. Uh, but that's an important point because if you had actually changed the mass, you would have a nuclear explosion. Like in a, when a nuclear bomb goes off, like the Hiroshima bomb, it was like a paperclip amount of mass that got converted to energy because the, you know, e equals mc squared, the speed of light is so big in vacuum. So, so that's a point that, um, that, that, that don't, don't talk about mass reduction. What you could talk about is the gravitational field reduction. In other words, whatever this device, maybe this Nazi bell thing, whatever it, it was doing, it may, you know, if it really worked as they claim, it, it's canceling the Earth's gravitational field is what it's doing. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to make a point that, you know, no, you're don't... correct. I, I've heard the term mass reduction. Yeah, they do theory. use it and it's sloppy. It's sloppy. So, yeah, so in the future, just say uh, gravitational field reduction. It's, it is weight reduction, but weight is a product of mass times the, the acceleration of gravity. So it's changing the acceleration field of gravity. Just a technical point because I want to be as accurate and precise as a physicist with, uh, you know, OCD. You know, I, everything has to yeah. be right. Well, that's something. German, you don't like that German professor. <laughs> I should have about there. You know, it's I, I I don't think it matured past the experimental stage in Nazi Germany. The question is whether the we Americans or the British or even the Russians got it to work. I think Red Mercury came from um, that Russian physicist mentioned it decades ago in a paper. Uh, Kazarov. Yeah, uh, I don't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Too bad Nick Cook isn't here because he wrote the book on this. Right? That's yeah. right. Yeah. No, Nick's a great guy. I did an interview with him. Yeah. Okay. We've got somebody new. Is that David wants to say something? Yeah, yeah I, I think say... Cre Creon, well, and I think Creon has his hand raised also. So David, let, go to Wait, you and then Creon, Creon after Creon? that. Yeah, I don't see him. Oh, there he is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, wow. Is that Creon? That's Creon. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, let me say something. Uh, uh, John was talking about that mine in Sudetenland. That was the Taylor mine, where the name of the dollar came from. That's where the Curies got their pitch blend. That that particular mine was owned by an aristocrat in the 1500s, and that's the mine where the Curies got the pitch blend, where they got the radium discovered radium from yeah and that, but i, I wanted to mention that. yeah but I, I i wanted to mention something because i think we're getting the germans did not connect really with what i know of as et i think we have to think about these people are telepaths whoever they are wherever they from they are telepaths and i started to know this in 2004, which is the same year as the Nimitz sighting. And my best friend was recruited by telepaths because of his psi ability and ended up take, being taken on time travel trips solely to surveil America's development of nuclear weapons and the Manhattan Project, starting with why would uh, people from a different planet take us back to do, to see how uh, Enrico Fermi and Leo Szilard, their first Chicago pile one, all the way to our Pacific hydrogen bomb detonations, they took back somebody as a human witness where it was Ingo Swan style, not remote viewing, but psychic penetration where your astral body would actually penetrate a local temporal person in that time and actually witness the view in full physical form and watch this detonation for five minutes or so and then leave and wow. dozens of times and i've debriefed him on this 
And most of the people, because John Ramirez was talking about what the CIA can say, nobody is talking about the fact that these people are telepaths and the amount of telepathic communication that's going on directly with people, people have no idea. The CIA, Chris Mellon, they have no idea what's really going on. This is much more complex than anybody imagines. This is, these are telepaths. It's more like what Pavo Pilkinen and Basil Haile have been talking about. They can share their actual mind space with people. This is what happened in all my personal experiences, traveling back in time with them, where I witnessed, I saw Hitler close up, as close as, you know, within two feet of me. I was in an SS trooper's body, and there is Hitler in 1938. I saw Fred Astaire. Why would they take me back into time to see this? I think it's time to look at what are these people really up to? And I have the feeling that they're completely open and above board. They are not selling us out with our, our leadership. There isn't going to be any disclosure. I do not believe that at all. I've been asking my own contact, which is what Jack has been talking about. Remember, Jack got the phone call from the computer in 1953. I had a full on vision of this computer in 2011. And it was like a, a computer, but it actually, in my mind, I knew that was just so I could see what the function was. It was really a living thing that could have been anything. They just wanted to direct my mind to what the function of something that's probably non-physical, maybe embedded in space-time. And I think we have to think about what are these people really doing and what are they up to? And it's very complex. I, I think that they may have even seated us here, but they're here and not in a hostile way, at least these particular people. And I, I think it would be good to start speaking about their intentions. And what are they here for? And why are they interested in Jack? I mean, I was directed to meet Jack more than 40 years ago. They were so interested in what Jack was doing. I gave him a cheap apartment just because I had this intuition that I must do it. And this is, and here he is still here at 83. It's unbelievable. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the whole thing, I mean, he looks so young too. I mean, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> but but it's, I, I just think that we have to think about the, the, the minds of these people and, and recognize that they are actual beings and they probably have homes and family and they, they listen to music. These aren't just, you know, they're not like science fiction people. They're actual, they're actual beings. They may be smarter than we are in some ways, but they're also just, okay. but they're telepaths. They have this thing that Tim and I have been talking about with the language. Yeah. They um, understand things. Go ahead. Um, am I speaking now? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, there are things actually I cannot talk about that actually relate to what John Ramirez is saying. I've I've come up, I've been given some very specific information, uh, and it's a real bind because I really can't give the source of this information. But what I can say is this: everything David's saying about the telepathy thing, yeah, you know, that that that's quite real. Um, and we understand the physics of that. It's what's called uh, Einstein, uh, EPR signaling. It involves a generalization of quantum mechanics. But I don't, you know, well, I'll get into that later when I talk about physics, you know, at another time. But I've been told some astounding information that I can't reveal. But I, I guess maybe it's going to be revealed uh, in September. I hope it's going to be revealed in September. Um, I have a, it's from it's from a, a direct source. It's from the guy a source that was actually in charge of this project. But what I can say is that um, everything that Phil Corso 
says in his book, Day After Roswell, about the structure of the craft. You know, 30 feet, you know, and inside it's empty and all that stuff. Even even Are Jacques Lee really? talks about it in Fast Walker in a fictional way. All that stuff. And also uh, what Rick Doty has said in public, which agrees exactly with what uh, Phil Corso has said, that that's all, uh, and we have to take that very, very seriously. And of course that does, yeah. And and that's all I can say about it, but um, it's astounding. And, and in terms of the paranormal, the high strangers aspect, there's there are astounding things about that too. But um, uh, so I'm, I'm basically bolstering what John Ramirez, you know, said is going to happen. I I think that may happen. Oh, uh, one thing about um, John Warner. Let me ask you. You know, what's this thing with Chris Mellon, your cousin, has been viciously attacking me. You know, and and let me let, let me give you a little background on that because this is polit this is this is important because the fate of the planet literally may depend on this kind of stuff. Uh, your cousin Chris was extremely friendly with me for quite a while. I have the emails. And it became clear to me he doesn't understand any physics. I mean, you know, um, which which makes sense because he was, a, you know, he you know, he never took a physics course really, and he was asking me very elementary questions about, um, you know, black holes stuff like that. And uh, we were up at this this place. Um, well, I'm sure your father went to, you know, this place in Northern California, and we were thinking of uh, uh, having a meeting up there with your cousin and and Chris was very interested in coming up there. Uh, 70 miles north of California. I can't mention the name of this place, but you know what I'm talking about, I think. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then and then and then and then I guess you know your cousin said something disparaging about Donald Trump. This is when Trump was still president, and I happen to like Donald Trump. Okay, you know. And so he got into a big tiff with me, and ever since then, then he's and you know he's been very vicious, and he's even gotten Louis Louis Elizondo has blocked me on Twitter. Now, why would they do that? I mean, it's pretty crazy, you know? And and um, uh, what they're doing though, I just want to say this to the public, they are damaging national security, US national security, because um, I claim, and I, of course I could be wrong, because anything that any scientist says about empirical phenomena is always, you know, if it's good science, it, could be, it, it, it can be wrong in principle, but, uh, and in fact, John, I thank John Ramirez for coming out publicly saying, hey, listen, these guys are, are, are not, you know, not doing what they should be doing, that they, they, they're basically gaslighting what, what I'm doing. And, um, you know, after all, it was the CIA who got me into this to begin with back over 50 years ago. <laughs> See, but it's not, you know, the, the CIA guys who got me into this, they're all dead now. They're old. They were old even back then. And not only CIA, but it's MI6, you know, the, Brit, the Brits too. So I think this is a big problem that maybe uh, John, since he is your cousin, since I know you, you, you could, don't quite get along with him, <clears throat> but um, we have to uh, heal this rift because it's not it's uh, it's damaging the United States. And oh yes, the big thing is that Moscow has invited me to Moscow to talk about all this stuff in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, the Russians Jack Sarpati has been invited. Are, yeah to Moscow State University Physics Department. They said, Jack, we would like you to give us your vision of UAP propulsion, you know, warp drive, UAP warp drive. So the Russians, yeah, plus uh, I can go into a whole lot of thing with me and the Russians. Uh, I was told that Vladimir Putin himself is interested in what Jack Sarfati is doing. I was told that by the Russians, okay? So this is big, this is major. Yep. And so we don't have, we can't have, you know, uh, your cousin Christopher Mellon and Louis Elizondo and Eric Davis, and especially John, uh, Colonel John Alexander, who are giving people like, um, you know, the Senator Gillibrand, uh, uh, Mark Warner, and, you know, all these people who want to know and have to know, <clears throat> including maybe the Director of National Intelligence. Well, whatever. The point is that that our military should really know what's going on. They should at least talk to me, find out and have a debate. We could all debate and say, is, is Jack uh, wrong? Why is he wrong? You, know, you have a rational debate, but they're not doing it. And that's very bad. And it's very bad for U.S. national security. Okay, that, so I want to make that point very clear. That, no, I, 
you, I agree. You, I if I could jump in really quick. Um, so Creon had a question. Sorry, I need to be better about when hands are raised. Um, yeah. Creon, did you did you still want to go? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is kind of popcorn. But uh, going back to what Jack said earlier about mass reduction versus weight reduction, I don't want to be too pedantic, but people need to understand that, or precisely what Jack said is mass reduction versus gravity field or, or, or space-time metric manipulation, technically, right, Jack? Um, yes. Anyway, and the issue there is this, that you can reduce the mass, you know, to as much 99.9% .9 or whatever you want, and, you know, ignoring issues of E equals MC squared, that really, all that's going to get you is um, a lighter object. It's not going to explain these alleged, um, you know, exotic maneuvers and much less uh, uh, faster than light travel and this kind of thing. In order to do those sorts of things without exhausting, without using propellant, which apparently, if you believe the reports these craft don't use, uh, it doesn't really matter if you reduce the mass. You have to manipulate the space-time metric or the gravity field or whatever you want to call it, because that's how you accelerate things, uh, you know, in sort of anomalous exotic ways and get them to go even faster than light if you have these warp drive metrics so that's important on a number of levels so just reinforcing jack stuff there the next thing i want to say is i'd be careful talking about red mercury and thorium and all this stuff just kind of throwing around these elements from the periodic table because you know somebody or some document somewhere mentions them. I mean, that's perhaps interesting, but uh, there's no physics behind any of that. Right. As far as I know. Yeah. So I, it's, it, it can't be that. It can't, it can't be, it, it's almost certainly not going to, you know, I'm all my, I'm willing to bet almost any odds that you're not going to find some, some bulk compound like mercury sulfide or whatever red mercury is, or, you know, thorium or element 115 or any of this hocus pocus that non-physicists talk about the the only way that i've seen that carries any promise to actually manipulate uh the metric or gravity or whatever you want to call it is um you know it's either got to be completely new physics beyond the standard model and beyond general relativity but nobody knows you know, after 50 years of trying how to really get anywhere with that. Um, or it's got to be something like Jack is talking about, where you're um, using kind of exotic structures that uh, where the speed of light internal to the medium is modulated and the coupling to the, the coupling of electromagnetism to the space-time metric is resonantly amplified these are technical topics but i mean this is where it's at you can't just throw out red mercury thorium element 115 you know or what have you telepathy whatever you know none of that stuff you can't telepathy throw that well. without having some physics to back it up i understand you can put it out there as a historical artifact like somebody said this in this document okay fair enough but but it's like if we actually want to get a handle on this stuff and not just you know uh, speak with anecdotes, but if we want to go into the lab and make something that um, might possibly work, then we've got to have our uh, our physics and our math and our engineering uh, legitimate. That's all. Oh, can I answer? I appreciate that. I agree. Um, but there's all these UFOs and craft flying around, Tic Tacs, probably Lockheed Martin. They're using some sort of elements in physics. So I think some of those sets of physics are withheld from the public uh, and technologies, of course. But Jack had a good point about uh, uh, Chris Mellon and the, my O&I friend, my DIA and CIA friends, uh, they tell me the U.S. military and the military industrial complex, oh, they know everything. Um, it's just everything is compartmentalized to death. Uh, that's We get that from the Germans and the SS. Uh, we directly learned that from Hans Kammler's operation. Uh, he was a contractor, you know, building all the tunnels and death camps. 
you know, everything was compartmentalized to keep it, you know, secure. So Chris Mellon is working from some sort of playbook, but I don't know why he's angry at you. Um, but you have to realize that all of us here today, we're all dissidents in his eyes. So we're, we're working with factions in the military industrial complex, the corporations and everything. And whatever factions he represent don't like you, Jack. Yeah. They certainly don't like me. <laughs> no, <I> don't <laughs> well, one, one of the reasons, one of the reasons I think that they don't like Jack and a number of other physicists who dabble in this area is because there appears to be, I mean, I don't actually believe that Lockheed Martin has gravity control spaceships flying around that, that, that doesn't. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me from a sort of Occam's razor point of view, but be that as it may, I could be wrong. I mean, one of the reasons they don't like uh, people like Jack, I suspect is kind of a, uh, it's kind of embarrassing that they have these unlimited budgets and these black programs and allegedly these alien artifacts and all this evidence that they're not revealing. And yet they can't come up with uh, they can't figure it out. They can't reverse engineer it, and they even less so can't like engineer it from scratch. Okay, which is arguably what we need to do if we're really gonna like play with the big boys. We can't be cargo culting this stuff yeah. uh, and just trying to dissect it in some lab and duplicate it without understanding it. Uh, we have to figure it out, and we have to develop it ourselves. At least that I claim would be would be optimal. Um, so uh, they, I think, but I don't know to what extent, some of this stuff is like, it's jealousy in a way. It's like, how could this, uh, you know, discredited crazy physicist Sarfati, like outside of academia and outside of the intelligence community and outside of the mainstream, you know, have, have done a better job than we have with all of our, uh, you know, best and brightest and, and, and money and secrecy. So, you know, this is speculation, but, yeah. but I, but nevertheless, it kind of, Makes sense. Okay. Let me let me respond. Where's uh, hello? We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me. <laughs> In fact, though, if you look back at everything, I'm really not out of the mainstream, because let's who look at my academic background. I was sent to Cornell. Uh, my professors built the atomic bomb, like Hans Bethe. Okay, um, I had a first class education. With these, you know, guys with even Richard Feynman and and David Bohm and Abdus Salam and all these guys, the guy Her Herbert Freulich. And um, I was on a tenure, you know, I was on a tenure track to be a professor at San Diego State. Basically, pulled out of academia by the CIA. You know, told over fifty years ago. Uh, George Koopman says, uh, who was funding us at the at Esalen, said, Jack, there are two things the CIA wants to know. How does consciousness work? And how all this paranormal stuff work? And how do the flying saucers fly? And basically, that's what I've been doing for 50 years. Yeah, Jack, no, look, look, I, yeah. you know, we've known each other for 40 years, and, and yeah. you know that I know all this stuff about you, and, and you yes. are mainstream, and you're more mainstream than the mainstream. Like the mainstream, yeah. like they, you've forgotten more <laughs> than they know about yeah. about uh, uh, standard physics. No, we, I know all this. I wasn't saying that I think. No, I'm not, I know you know it. I'm talking about you know people out there. I, I don't mean that you don't know it. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> I'm talking to them. Um, if it's okay, let let me let me close this conversation. If it's okay, okay. and then I I will go to Robert. Because I'm getting angry. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> well, it's okay because this all uh, feeds into my talk pretty directly so we'll uh we'll get going then uap observations and metric engineering patterns and examples from the 20th and 21st centuries so why does this subject matter and i have three points here about why it matters first a very large number of uap sightings have been reported and published in various forms over the last 80 or so years basically since world war ii 
And I mean, arguably, in in our email discussions, we've had many discussions about how maybe there are valid uh, reports of UAP and such craft going back before World War II. But the uh, you have uh, you know mo modern sort of or organizations like MUFON and so on have been around more recently and and putting those together. So. Uh, as I say here, some of the sources and publications appear credible and are reported in a reasonably intellectually rigorous manner. And the second point is that since 1994, the concept of the Alcubierre space-time warp bubble has gradually evolved into greater detail in theoretical physics, leading to the creation of various theories about how such metric engineering effects might be created. Similarly, the Moritz Thorne wormhole metric, another met metric engineering effect, has had significant discussions since the 1980s. And third, although metric engineering is still a field in its early stages and there is disagreement about exactly how warp bubbles might be created, there has been sufficient discussion to put in place some outlines and make Alcubierre type metrics a possible explanation for some UAP observations. So amongst the core points here, the argument here is that a significant number of UAP observations correlate well with what we would expect to see from Alcubierre type warp bubbles, usually operating at slower than light speeds when people see them in the uh, atmosphere uh, or when, when the USS Nimitz has its encounter, the F-18s have their encounter with the Tic Tac. The Tic Tac isn't operating at uh, faster than light. And Alcubierre, or his metric originally was for faster than light, but uh, we'll get into this later in the talk, how as the topic has evolved, there's also, uh, I mean, Jack has, has spoken a lot in the last few years about how it can function slower than light as well. So I know Jack will say, well, this is, uh, you know, the the metric engineering warp bubble effect is really the only, only uh, real explanation. I mean, just as a point of academic rigor, I will say that this may not be the only possible explanation, but it is one that should be studied ex extensively. And it is the explanation that is preferred by some of the physicists participating here, including Jack. And this talk is just the beginning. The history of UF UAP observations is a topic that can be continuously added to. And, uh, as I've already mentioned, some organizations have, have collected literally thousands of uh, sightings of, of UAP events. And here we're looking at some representative examples and general patterns. And then the next slide, I know a lot of people have been annoyed by Avilo, but I do like to make the point that conventional explanations are already being studied. Avi Loeb's Galileo project will explore propulsion options such as rockets and light sails in terms of observations of unusual phenomena around the Earth and in the solar system. In overview of the Galileo project, Loeb and a co-author write that they will also work on eliminating sightings caused by natural and human-made objects or phenomena. So that's already being being done. We don't have to we don't need any of these arguments about, oh, why are you guys looking at at uh, warp drive and so on when it's like there's already there's this Avi Loeb and there's others who have, have been and continue to look at all the possible conventional explanations. The separate effort that looks at metric engineering as an explanation is therefore arguably warranted. So structure for the rest of this talk. The preceding four slides were outlining the why. Why should we talk about this? And the remainder is organized into the following parts. First, an overview of the literature on metric engineering, in particular Alcubierre warp bubbles. Second, a discussion of some of the characteristics of warp bubbles that would correlate with widely noticed characteristics of UAP sightings. Information pointed out over the last few years by people like Luz Elizondo and by websites like uaptheory.com is relevant here. 
And I mean, well, we'll get to it. But the, this is, I'm not quoting Elizondo in any detail, but things like the, the five characteristics slide, which is later in this uh, presentation, we'll see. And then third, a review of a few examples of more compelling work covering UAP observations and how various of the sightings discussed in those works support the pattern of correlations between expected characteristics of metric engineering war bubbles and the widely noted characteristics of UAP sightings. And I like to add, because I'm a military historian as well, this will hopefully provide a basis for historians and social scientists to engage with this topic, not just physicists and engineers, although obviously the physicists and engineers are the most important to engage with this topic, but it, it would be good to get some more uh, multidisciplinary thought happening. So uh, starting with the metric engineering literature here, the Einstein, Rose, Bridge, and Schwarzschild wormholes were described in the physics literature soon after general relativity was developed. Logwood Flam published a bridge-type metric, and Schwarzschild wrote about a type of eternal black hole that could function a bit like a traversable wormhole around 1916. And Einstein and Rosen published their bridge description in 1935. Traversable wormholes were then discussed in a paper by Homer Ellis and also in another paper by K.A. Bronikov, both published in 1973. In 1988, Pip Thorne and his graduate student Mike Morris published a similar traversable wormhole metric as what Ellis had written, in part to provide a more realistic and non techno babble method for faster than light travel in Carl Sagan's book Contact. And there's from the Wikipedia page. I mean, we most all or most of us here know this stuff, but there's your, your two dimensional representation of the four dimensional wormhole, a sort of metric drawing. And then also, like this one on the Wikipedia page is an image of a simulated traversable wormhole that connects the square in front of the physical institutes of the University of Tübingen with the sand dunes near Boulogne-sur-Mer in the north of France. The image is calculated with 4D ray tracing and a Morris Thorne wormhole metric, but the gravitational effects of the wavelength have not been simulated. So that's maybe a bit more realistic than what the... the uh, sort of metric drawing is. So nonetheless, despite this, the uh, papers have, have been written about them, traversable wormholes have not usually been seen as metrics that could be generated in a practical manner by foreseeable technology. Morris and Thorne argued rather that their model was useful for teaching general relativity. They wrote, Rapid interstellar travel by means of space-time wormholes is described in a way that is useful for teaching general relativity and about contact here, you see. Uh, they, they note that many objections are given against the use of black holes of, or Schwarzschild wormholes for rapid interstellar travel. A new class of solutions of the Einstein field equations is presented which describe wormholes that, in principle, could be traversed by human beings. It is essential in these solutions that the wormhole possess a throat at which there is no horizon. And this property, together with the Einstein field equations, places an extreme constraint on the material that generates the wormhole space-time curvature. And uh, Morris actually has their original essay published at that. Uh, it's online at that URL. So then in 1994, Mexican theoretical physicist Miguel Alcubier, then at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Wales, wrote the paper, The Warp Drive, Hyperfast Travel Within General Relativity. That paper was published in Classical and Quantum Gravity, issue 11.5. Alcubier stated that it has shown how, within the framework of general relativity and the introduction of wormholes, it is possible to modify a spacetime in a way that allows a spaceship to travel with an arbitrarily large speed. By a purely local expansion of spacetime behind the spaceship, 
and an opposite contraction in front of it, motion faster than the speed of light as seen by observers outside the disturbed region is possible. The resulting distortion is reminiscent of the warp drive of science fiction. However, just as it happens with wormholes, exotic matter will be needed in order to generate a distortion of space-time like the one discussed here. And Alcubierre's original paper is also, it's up on archive at that uh, URL. And that's his original 1990s uh, graphic of his uh, warp bubble effect. I mean, the important features here when you look at this is, is and this comes back to the discussion that we were just having, uh, the, the interior area of the warp bubble metric here is flat. You can see the middle is flat, so there's no G-forces in there. And this is what, what uh, Jack and Creon were, the point they were trying to make. You need that that flat area where it doesn't matter if the, the, uh, if the mass is reduced, you're still going to feel the G-forces if you don't have this sort of uh, flattened out area in, in the center. And then the part behind this peak is illustrating the... Uh, the expansion of, of space time in one direction and the trough is is like any drawing of a gravity well that uh, people do in a book that's uh, the space time being contracted on the other side of the craft and that's how it can it can move this expansion contraction around as it generates it but that's how it moves in directions and there's a more uh, a, a more recent illustration of the same thing but that's with uh, after the year 2000 graphics. <laughs> so uh, since Al Kubier published his paper, a significant amount of additional work on warp bubble metrics has been done. For example, if you search for warp drive on archive, as of uh, right now in May 2023, you get 203 results. So a thorough literature review of the topic would be an extensive project in itself, which should probably be undertaken by a physicist. In the email discussions amongst Jack Sarfati and some of some other physicists and the rest of us, um, over the last 10 to 15 years, we have occasionally one of these uh, papers like the of the 203 in archive comes up. It's a point of discussion. We we discussed the Natario variation a couple of times, but uh, in general, you can summarize that that the uh, some of these papers make modifications to the warp bubble metric, which make it appear less impractical as a realizable technology. So then, uh, in terms of U.S. government interest, we see that. Hal Potoff wrote, wrote the paper Advanced Space Propulsion Based on Vacuum or Space-Time Metric Engineering as a Defense Intelligence Agency reference document. In the now declassified Advanced Aerospace Threat and Identification Program or ATIP product list, it is listed as unclassified for official use only. And Federation of American Scientists has that A tip list online there. So again, anyone who's interested, I can I can uh, send you my presentation here, and or I can send you all of the uh, links if you don't know know where to get them. So uh, going on, the papers traversable wormholes, stargates, and negative energy and anti gravity for aerospace applications by Eric Davis were also included on this list, again, as unclassified for official use only. Puthoff published his paper in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society in 2010. He wrote that a theme has come to the fore in advanced planning for long-range space exploration in the concept that empty space itself, the quantum vacuum or space-time metric, might be engineered as to, so to provide energy or thrust for future space vehicles. Although such far, although far reaching, such a proposal is solidly grounded in modern physical theory, and therefore the possibility that matter vacuum interactions might be engineered for spaceflight applications is not a priority ruled out. 
As examples, the current development of theoretical physics addresses such topics as warp drives, traversable wormholes, and time machines that provide for such vacuum engineering possibilities. We provide here from a broad perspective the physics and correlates or consequences of the engineering of the space-time metric. And again, his paper is on archive as well. So I'm going to go over a few of the points he makes in detail because they're really one of the, the first examples of where the expected behavior of uh, warp drives uh, was starting to be characterized and, and we can correlate this with UAP observations. So Hal says, the concept of engineering the vacuum found its first expression in the physics literature when it was introduced by Nobilis T.D. Lee in his textbook, Particle Physics and Introduction to the Field Theory. There he stated, the experimental method to alter the properties of the vacuum may be called vacuum engineering. If indeed we are able to alter the vacuum, then we may encounter new phenomena, totally unexpected. This legitimization of the vacuum engineering concept was based on the recognition that the vacuum is characterized by parameters and structure that leave no doubt that it constitutes an energetic and structured medium in its own right. Foremost among these are that first, within the context of quantum theory, the vacuum is the seat of energetic particle and field fluctuations. And second, within the context of general relativity, the vacuum is the seat of a space-time structure or metric that encodes the distribution of matter and energy. Despite the daunting energy requirements to restructure the space-time metric to a significant degree, the forms that such restructuring would take to be useful for spaceflight applications can be invest investigated, and their corollary and attributes and consequences determined. From such a study, the signatures that would accompany such advanced technology craft can be outlined, and possible effects of the technology with regard to space-time effects that include such phenomena as the distortion of space and time can be catalogued. This would include, among other consequences, cataloging effects that might be potentially harmful to human physiology. Amongst the effects that Puthoff observes a redshift, writing, should such a time-slowed condition be engineered in an advanced aerospace application, an individual having spent time within such a temporarily modified field would, when returned to the normal environment, find that more time had passed than could be experientially accounted for. If uninformed about the metric engineered characteristics of the environment from which he emerged, the individual might be inclined to interpret the experience in terms of a missing time. Conversely, for other types of engineered space-time associated with an advanced aerospace craft, time flow within the altered space-time region would appear sped up to an external observer, while to an internal observer, external time flow would appear to be in slow motion. In this scenario, close approach to a craft could leave one with the impression of, say, a 20-minute time interval, whereas only a few minutes would have passed in real or normal or exterior time. A corollary would be that within the space-time altered region, normal environmental sounds from outside the region might cease to be registered, since external sounds could, under these conditions, redshift below the auditory range. An additional implication of time speed up within the frame of such an exotic craft technology is that its flight path might seem precipitous from an external viewpoint such as sudden acceleration or deceleration, would be experienced as much less so by the craft's occupants. From the occupant's viewpoint, observing the external environment to be in relative slow motion, it would not be surprising to consider that one's relatively modest changes in motion would appear abrupt to an external observer. And then I've noted here, again, amongst our discussion group, the uh, view that so the flat space-time region in the center of an Alcubier warp bubble should be should have no G forces at all. But again, these things were like when Hal Padoff was writing his paper. This is really just being written up in a rigorous manner for the first time. 
So, and then other features that he notice uh, that he notes also include that a craft's properties might appear hardened relative to the uh, exterior environment due to the increased binding e energies of atoms in its material structure. So it could, say, impact water at high velocities without apparent deleterious effects. And we do see in some videos, we see the uh, UAP going into, into water and coming out. And I know there's there could be different arguments exactly about how it's doing that. It, I'm not sure that we would currently agree with Potov's statement here. But again, it shows the, the uh, effects that, that can be expected to arise. He notes radiation hazards for external observers, which we've discussed extensively in recent years by email. Uh, he notes a craft appearing to shrink from the pr perspective of a remote observer when you're standing somewhere and you see a, a uh, UAP in the distance and people report sometimes they seem to change in size. There can be refractive index effects such as cloaking or blinking out where the craft disappears and uh, or it looks like it disappears to the external observer. And uh, I note that uh, Potov's paper may have been what popularized the term metric engineering. I, I don't know, Jack, maybe you can comment later. Maybe you you started using it first in the 1990s or something. But it's, uh, um, but you don't really see it that often before uh, the about 2010 in this paper. So, and then uh, vacuum engineering, uh, yeah, vacuum engineering, space-time engineering, space-time modification, and other such terms would also be reasonable. But metric tensor engineering or simply metric engineering seems to have caught on. And so it's what I'm using throughout this presentation. So apart from the those papers in the literature review, then we just have, we have a few other people doing things that are worth noting I mean, at NASA Eagle Works, you had Harold Sonny White. He claimed creation of a nanoscale warp bubble in a custom Casimir cavity, although there's disagreement as to whether this was actually a meaningful result. And the debrief.org, it is uh, some articles on on Eagle Works topics. There you see a, a nice Eagle Works graphic of what Eagle Works says we could do if we have the warp drive in terms of interstellar travel. Then you have Woodward, James Woodward. In 2013, his book, Making Starships and Stargates, was published by Springer. It is a peer-reviewed book, but nonetheless, Woodward's model of the universe has drawn criticism for mixing a Newtonian gravitational potential with general relativity theory. In the book, Woodward included a proposal to obtain negative energy densities for metric engineering by exposing the negative bare mass of electrons based on the arnowitz daser meisner model of the electron. And Jack has criticized this specific aspect of Woodward's theory, as well as Woodward's theory more generally, writing that the bare mass of the electron is at the scale of classical electron radius 10 to the power of negative 13 centimeters. The cloud of virtual photons is at 10 to the power of negative 11 centimeters. The real far field photons in Jim's contraptions are of much longer wavelength and lower energy, and they cannot strip away the virtual photon electron positron pair plasma to expose the naked negative mass in the ADM model. And then, we have Jack's variation of uh, warp drive theory itself, uh, which, of course, Jack will talk about much more later during this conference. But Jack has proposed a low power version of the Alcubier warp drive. It focuses on reducing space time stiffness, or put another way, increasing the coupling between a frolic coherent electromagnetic field and space time. And Jack has worked out in detail various aspects of how such a drive would operate at sublight speeds. And uh, the, his, what Jack comes up with includes many of the same effects that Potov predicts in his uh, 
DIA uh, Journal of British Interplanetary Society paper. And that leads us to an interesting point about the, the shape of warp bubble spacecraft. Although the theoretical basis is very difficult, both is very different. Both Woodward and Sarfati have models in which the warp bubble has to be generated in the skin of the spacecraft. Woodward proposes layers of piezoelectrics. Sarfati believes that certain types of metamaterials will work, but that a great deal of additional research is likely necessary in order to figure out exactly what kind. Such models suggest that the shape of the spaceship has to fit the shape, at least the inside of the shape of the warp field, that flat area, a bit like a hand has to fit inside a glove. So as a result, you would expect to encounter craft shaped as relatively simple geometric objects, flying saucers, Tic Tacs, globes, and so on. And here is uh, from CN, CNN a picture of a, a kind of a house, 1950s flying saucer house. I just, I thought it's amusing, but it makes the point that, you know, you want a, a simple, relatively simple structure to do the warp bubble calculations and fit inside your own warp bubble. And there is a screenshot of PBS of uh, the one of the USS Nimitz videos with the, the Tic Tac in the uh, distance being recorded by a uh, F-18. And so uh, again, a relatively simple shape. So then as I mentioned at the start, I was going to mention Elizondo and some of the others to the Stars Academy. I mean, they they generated a few of these uh, slides that, that we send around in our discussions. This uh, particular ATIP slide, it covers a number of things like stuff that you also see at Skinwalker Ranch, but you do see the point in here of anomalies in the space-time construct and the comment that what was considered phenomena is now quantum physics. So uh, that's uh, important in taking metric engineering seriously. And then there's the five observable slides. So this really, in a simpler way than the Potthoff paper, this uh, summarizes it nicely. Number one, sudden and instantaneous acceleration. Number two, hypersonic velocities without signatures three, low observability, four, transmedium travel, like being able to, to fly through space and then the atmosphere and then into the water and back out of the water, and positive lift without uh, any obvious thrusters like uh, rockets or, or jet engines. So uh, continuing with these characteristics of UAP, uh, the website UAP Theory, theory is a uh, reasonably well presented summary of the sort of effects uh, we've already seen discussed. For example, it states that requiring that UAPs are consistent with the laws of motion leads us to a gravitational propulsion system, for lack of a better term, which has the following implications. First, that UAPs should be rounded geometrical as there is no preferred forward facing direction. Since they use space time as their control service, they need no wings or afterburners. Second, UAPs can maneuver in sharp angles at high speeds because they move on geodesics and in zero G. I mean, uh, basically a, a slightly different set of five points, but making the same points that we've seen so far. And the UAP theory side also has some nice videos on it, like the uh, uh, bunch of versions of the 2013 Puerto Rico UAP uh, video. So it's it's a good introduction. If you know someone who you think should learn about metric engineering and UAP warp drives, get them to read that, that site. <laughs> uh, so now we're moving on to the sort of sources we can we can use to correlate between those uh, that all the, the theory and the characteristics and what people actually respond seeing, uh, report seeing. So um, a quality of reports from organizations like MUFON can vary. And uh, 
you, as, as I show here, some commentators attack the quality of MUFON reporting, com complaining that it, all sorts of stories of alien abductions, conspiracy theories, human ET hybrids, and so on, are unscientific. So it's, I mean, some of us here will disagree with that. We'll say that all those things are things that have to be investigated. Others may say, yeah, we don't want, we want to keep the intellectual discussion more rigorous. But we have, we do have more rigorous sources than, say, uh, MUFON. For instance, uh, one source that ties together accounts of UAP observations with a theory of metric engineering type propulsion as unconventional flying objects by Paul R. Hill. And I'm just going to quote from uh, Robert M. Wood, who was also a physicist and engineer, uh, aeronautical engineer, who wrote the foreword to uh, Hill's book. Wood wrote, NASA aeronautical engineer Paul R. Hill began to collect and analyze evidence about unidentified flying objects during the 1950s, but he could not publish anything about UFOs while employed by NASA. After Hill died in 1991, it was possible to publish the book that he wrote while working for NASA. Hill was a good engineer. He designed the fuselage for the World War II P-47 fighter bomber, and his UFO analysis drew on his knowledge of the physics and engineering of flight. While at NASA, Hill designed and flew a machine that used some the same basic principle of thrust. And yeah, I mean, we, we don't use thrust anymore because that's not actually what's going on with uh, Alcubier drives. But again, remember, this is... Hill is doing this before, or he's looking at a UFO, UAP observations before all the theories worked out. So uh, he he made something that kind of uh, like it 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 could hover on on uh, air pressure, but he uh, didn't have the anti gravity drive. That drive would have allowed the principle to explain the observed near Earth performance of UFOs and by extension, their interstellar performance. Hill knew that UFO technology so far exceeded the capability of terrestrial technology that UFOs could not have been made by uh, present-day humans. Hill's approach was 20 years ahead of its time. He never became trapped in the endless speculation about the reality of UFOs. He accepted the reports at face value and let his analysis of the observed phenomenon speak for itself and his methodology was impeccable. He took the reported observations and then directly evaluated alternative hypotheses, exploring all relevant aspects of the observations. His comprehensive analyses dealt with size, color, halos, clouds, wakes, jitter, heat, maneuvers, performance, sound, solidity, landing, weight, nests and rings, propulsion, propulsive forces, force fields, radiation, merging systems, occupants, collection, interference, weaponry, and artifacts. So, and then again, my own commentary based on, on that. Based on subsequent work on the Alcubier warp drive, we would now say that there is not thrust involved in the UAP movement. But nonetheless, by deduction, Hill reached the conclusion that UAP were using what he conceived of as artificial gravity force fields before the physics literature based around Alcubier's 1994 paper came into being. And I'm getting near the end. I know I'm going on a bit long here, but uh, it's some, some good stuff to, to look at. So another well-written and reasonably intellectually rigorous book covering a number of UAP sightings is the 2010 book, UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record, by investigative journalist Leslie Keane. Michio Kaku provided a blurb for the cover of the book. He wrote, at last, a serious and thoughtful book about this controversial subject. Keen was also one of the authors of the New York Times articles in 2017 that discussed the ATIP uh, program and included uh, on uh, the New York Times website website copies of some of the of the three U.S. Navy F-18 UAP videos. 
Uh, so writing about what drew her to the subject, Keene states 10 years ago. So as her book came out in 2010, that would have been about 2000 or 23 years ago now. As an investigative reporter working for California public radio station, I was suddenly confronted with a seemingly impossible reality. A colleague in Paris sent me an extraordinary new study by former high ranking French officials documenting the existence of UFOs and exploring their potential impact on national security. Now known as the Cometa Report, this unprecedented white paper marked the first time in any country that a group of this size and stature had declared that UFOs, solid but as yet unexplained objects in the sky, constitute a real phenomenon warranting immediate international attention. The distinguished Cometar authors, 13 retired generals, scientists, and space experts working independently of the French government, had spent three years analyzing military and pilot encounters with UFOs. In the cases they present, all conventional explanations of something natural or man-made had been eliminated by the authors and their associated teams of experts. And yet these objects were observed at close range by pilots, tracked on radar and officially photographed. They achieved tremendous speeds and accelerations, made sharp right angle turns in a flash and could stop and stand still in midair, seeming to defy the laws of physics. What could this mean? Since some of the military officers on the Cometa panel were serving with the French Institute of Higher Studies for National Defense, a French government finance strategic planning agency, their characterization of UFOs as a phenomenon with possible national security implications assumed a grave importance. And then she talks a bit more about the uh, their 90 page report and the uh, that they they thought that the most logical explanation was uh, the extraterrestrial hypothesis. I comment, and again, we just dis had this in our discussion an hour ago, that uh, a warp bubble moving at faster than light speeds uh, could also, in theory, allow travel into one's own past light cone. Because that's, I mean, that's with a Jack can explain it better than me, but uh, that's within general relativity. If you can bypass the light speed limit and move faster than light, you can necessarily achieve trajectories that will take you into your own past. Uh, so the point is that rigorously documented UAP observations correlate, correlate well with the expected behavior of craft operating on the principles of the Alcubia drive and metric engineering. And then last but not least is, of course, the more the recently released U.S. Uh, Navy videos, which the U U.S. Navy acknowledged as uh, as uh, authentic in uh, after 2017, and they can be uh, found at these uh, website addresses. But I mean, you can you can also find the the UAP videos all, all over YouTube, so you don't have to go to the government website to download them. So conclusion, again, summarizing the behavior of the UAP in the US Navy videos is again consistent with the theory that these craft are operating using the principles of metric engineering. Now, no apparent thrust, uh, like no apparent, no jet or uh, rocket engines, no propellant no uh, and an ability to accelerate very quickly and so on essentially as has been argued in this presentation a number of sound sources documenting uap observations in detail exist and the accounts detailed in them correlate with an alcubia warp bubble type technology does this prove that these are warp drive craft based on conversations with jack i expect that he would say yes I do not think that we can actually say anything for sure without having empirical proof, either retrieval of a crashed craft or building one ourselves. However, the correlation is strong and there is enough evidence to con support continued multidisciplinary as well as theoretical physics research of the metric engineering option.
So that's my talk. Wonderful. Robert, thank you so much. Thank you so You're much. I'm, why don't I do this? Uh, if it's okay, okay, let me stop your screen share. Yeah, yeah, you can unshare and. Okay. We'll and go back to. Yeah. Okay. Stop sharing. There we go. Um, so yeah, it, everyone, if you have questions for Robert, please raise your hand. Ah, uh, Jack, go for it. Yeah. Just like, yeah. Uh, Robert, that was a beautiful, uh, beautiful discussion. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yes, I would say I do. Uh, I agree with what you said at the end. And again, I want to emphasize, I have new information only in the last few days, which has all the empirical verification anybody mm -hmm. needs. Uh, sadly, uh, the person who has this information is afraid for his life if he reveals it. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, this whistleblower stuff that, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that the Senate is, is talking about, has that actually happened or are they still talking about it? the whistleblower protection for UFOs? Is that, is that a, a fact? Theory. It's what? a theory. It's, it's, it's just been proposed. It's never actually been put. Okay. In. Well, I, I, I have direct information, not from a, a second hand, from the guy in charge of a particular investigation for several years. Okay. You know, uh, impeccable, impeccable source. And I've been told things that I cannot reveal his ID, and I and I I, and I, I can't only to say that everything that Phil Corso and Rick Doty say about this topic, about the sources, the interior of them, all that stuff, and even more that I can't say that really astounded me. Um, you know, great details. Uh, that there is now no question. So this is kind of consistent with what, with what John Ramirez was was saying, uh, that and. Um, I don't know if if I don't know if Chris Mellon knows this or not, but uh, I, I don't know what he knows. But but I, I now have some really astounding verification um, that the, the the craft are real. We have retrieved craft more than one uh, U.S. force, and and all, 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 it's all compartmentalized as 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 John Water and I, I think somebody else may have said. So left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. But I have direct testimony from a guy who was there, who was, in, you know, and I can't tell you everything he said. But um, at this point, anybody who who says this stuff is not real, they're either stupid or they're deliberately lying. And, you know, just, uh, I mean, they're assholes. Okay. <laughs> don't pay attention to them. As, as far as I'm, I'm concerned. Now, of course, maybe I'm being fooled. I don't think so. I'd say the probability that my information is accurate. I'd say is over ninety five percent probability because this guy is a, is a real straight arrow. All right, so I guess I, I'm just repeating myself. So, okay, well, no, yeah. thanks. I mean, I I hope that that sort of information can come out more uh, in the future. Uh, one thing I would add, uh, uh, just what you mentioned there about the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. I know yeah. a lot of people like to to. Uh, ascribe things to government conspiracy theories, and that is, uh, I mean, conspiracies can happen, but I think at times you also have to look at government behavior through uh, the, the concept of organizational theory, and uh, you do see that effect can, can happen very frequently, where one government department just doesn't it doesn't know what another is doing. Their their standard operating procedures are different. Their uh, you know the personalities running the departments are different. So government can do very bizarre and illogical things at times. Where you look at it and you say, oh, it must be some sort of they must be trying to cover it up. No, it's sometimes it's just that the two branches are not. They're yeah. doing yeah, stuff that looks that. illogical <laughs> because they don't communicate. I, well, also so, be, I, be advised that, uh, and that was a great presentation. Thanks. Be advised that, that when people say the government, this is a, a misnomer. Uh, yeah. This subject, UFOs, ET visitation, the, the physics, everything, it's locked up not only in military hands, but corporate hands. Yeah. which is free from government oversight. 
Um, trust me, this guy, Tim Burchett, Tim Burchett, the congressman who's coming out and say, oh, this is a UFO cover up and, you know, they're, they're hiding things from us. Well, he's on the right track, but he's dumb as a mud fence. I mean, he's yeah. completely ignorant. Even Rubio and Gillibrand, who are associated with Mellon and the UAP task force, uh, they're, they're working with very thin. Uh, they got a briefing on their desk that was very thin. Uh, yeah. My dad told me, he said, you know, people get different amounts of briefings. Yeah. And he was somewhere in the middle. You know, I agreed yeah. the MJ-12 files were mostly real, you know, and he warned me not to go down this road. But, you know, <laughs> you know it, it's this is not government. There, there are corporate private factions with trillions of dollars, I believe, um, controlled by roundtables with acronyms we have no knowledge of. And the guys down the hall in the Pentagon are like, well, we're working with the XYZ Corporation on this project. And it's like, I've never heard of that. And I'm a four-star general. You know, so this is what we're dealing with. It's a very confusing melee of who has the knowledge of metric engineering, of warp drives, and quantum uh, uh, entanglement between two isotopes. Isotopes is a propulsion system. And whether or not time is time is Time is not linear, it exists all at once. And that's a whole other section, the time corporations. You know, I've got that down because that's part of space travel. So it, it's we have to start thinking a thousand steps ahead. And I mean, I'm a right brain person of imagination. And yeah. we gotta stop, we gotta, this is great to discuss it, but it's like they're keeping physics, physics and science and math hidden. They've figured all this crap out. And we're all dancing <laughs> around, you know. Uh, Holy shit! Wants to add something more. (laughs) Oh, Uh, uh, okay. Go for it, Jack. Yeah. Okay. I agree with what John just said, but um, can you hear me? By the way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I agree with what you just said, but here's the thing, and here's why I'm a very dangerous man to them. So if I suddenly disappear, I did not commit suicide. I'm not. I didn't. I'm like Epstein. (laughs) I didn't commit. The physics of this stuff is basically simple. It's not difficult. You don't need quantum gravity. You don't need string theory. You don't need, it's basically, you know, once you accept the reality of the UFO phenomena, the five observables, you know, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Robert Adnell talked about, and also the, the other slide, the two slides of uh, Louis Elizondo, the, the, the high strangers, the conscious, you know, the paranormal slide and the five observable gravity slides. And they're two sides of the same coin. Turns out they're connected. Turns out that in 1975 or so, when George Koopman said, Jack, two things CIA really wants to know, how does consciousness work and how do the flying saucers work? Those are really the same problem. They're, 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 they're connected to each other. The physics is very simple. And uh, the only reason that the top physicists have not discovered this in the past is because they've been uh, afraid to face the, you know, because of the disinformation campaign that uh, if you if you're into UFOs, you're a crazy nutcase. Okay, so that's why. And um, uh, since it's so simple, all this stuff that the trillions of dollars that these private corporations are doing, they're basically defrauding the taxpayer. Okay, <laughs> they're basically defrauding the taxpayer. So I'm the wild guy. I'm not the joker in the deck. It's so bloody simple. You guys are a bunch of idiots. And you know, any graduate student, any any smart undergraduate in physics can now go off and do it on their own. They can't. There's nothing more to hide. It's all been disclosed in terms of the basic. I mean, physics is important. Okay, yeah. you know Maxwell's equations. They led to all electricity and everything, you know, uh, the steam engine, thermodynamics, uh, you know, uh, and now quantum mechanics, the computer revolution. You can't stop that. You can't stop that now. And, you know, smart kids are still working on it their own. It's out of the hands. You know, it's oh, you know, you're a historian. It's like um, there was the chivalry with the knights on on, on yeah. in the arm and the mouth, and then there came the longbow, right? The longbow and the yeah. average. So that, uh, uh, yeah, I've, been, I've given you the longbow. <laughs> it's a lot simpler than anybody thought. And the yeah. only reason I didn't see it uh, sooner was because all the papers on general relativity, when they write down the equations, they let the speed of light equal to one. 
they you know they did because they're mathematicians they're not engineers okay so so it's so it's so bloody simple basically it's elementary it's elementary my dear watson okay <laughs> so uh yeah they they these guys are afraid of me and they'll do everything they can to gaslight me uh, and i'm sorry and what i'm saying is, i'm talking about eric david talking about your cousin uh chris mellon and Pendolfi calls them crooks and loons. When Pendolfi comes out with his crooks and loons, he's talking about, he's talking about <laughs> Elizondo, you know, he's talking about all these people and also people in the, you know, who, who are hiding the, the truth about this. So, um, so we got a real problem here. I mean, we got a problem, Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so we, we have about seven minutes left. If it's okay, uh, let me go to Michael, who has his hand up. Uh, sorry about before. Hopefully my uh, computer doesn't freeze up again. Um, but uh, yeah, so the previous uh, presentation, very nice uh, overview of the goings on at the moment. Uh, two things I noticed, uh, if we have a Sarfati field in a material um, and the gravitational field is very sharp, then that means, I guess, does that imply that the mechanical strength of whatever metamaterial has to be very high? In order well, to that's, that, that's a good question. It's a question of detail, and the answer is I don't know. But obviously, what I do know is that we see these things flying around. So any of these apparent obstacles, are, you know, are not fatal because these things are flying around, and the only way they can fly around is with warp drive. I, again, right. let me make it an let me make an analogy. When Einstein predicted the gravitational bending of light by the sun, that was a crucial experiment for his theory. What Louis Ellis, the good thing, I mean, Louis has done a good thing that that slide, the five observables is my Eddington experiment. There's only one way to explain it. You know, in science and physics, uh, an organizing principle, as Einstein said, keep it as simple as possible, but not simpler than is possible. And that's exactly the warp drive explanation as Robert Adnell very nicely you know, presented is the obvious elementary simple explanation and i'm not the only one who's come to that conclusion this guy thor who did you know that that website that adnell um uh cited that was done independently of me but he came up with the same conclusions but he didn't have the dynamic the mechanism that i have yeah you know that guy he's he's uh He's an observational astronomer, and he said he did like a Paul Hill for like a detective. He has clues, and and uh, like uh, Sherlock Holmes, and he comes up with the the kind of explanation that has to be warp drive that explains everything. But he doesn't explain how you can get warp drive with small amounts of energy, and that's what I claim that I have done in principle. Okay, so uh, so, so I'm not the only one saying this. You know, other people, any yeah, you know, even other well, and again, Hal put off, Hal put off did coin. Uh, the word spectric engineering, which is the best thing he's done, he's done in this field, but everything else he's done is not really right and doesn't even address the issues. And, um, and but he's selling that to the government. So the other thing I saw from the uh, yeah. presentation um, was the, uh, is, is time indeed boosted within the warp bubble? So no, no, okay, <laughs> wait, that's a, oh, yeah, that, uh, a point, okay. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because Adnil, he uh, may have given the wrong impression there. The whole point of the Alcubierre warp drive is that there is no relative time dilation between the crew on the inside and the distant observers. Now you can design you can design a warp drive in which there is such a difference, but but you, in other words, you can control. That's a control. That's a control parameter. Whether there's going to be any time distortion, uh, any difference in 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 uh, aging, let's say, between the guys inside the craft and the guys outside the craft. What Alcubierre did, he did in such a way there won't be any any discrepancy. It'll be exactly the same. Okay, cool. But Just for yeah. example, what, I, mean, what I would example. mention there is is that yeah. in some uh, you and I mean some of the UAP or or UFO stories when people claim to have been abducted by aliens. Now yes. I'm not endorsing or refuting any of no. those. I'm just saying that that we have seen this claim that uh yes. people have missing time sometimes. Yes, I have I had so, I have I have missing yeah. time. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not saying you can't do that. You could do both. You have a choice. They have a choice. With metric injury, it's your choice how you want to design the system. Let me just give you an example. Let's take Jesus Christ on the cross, okay? Let's say so. Let's suppose. Let's suppose you know there really was a real historical Jesus. 
he was on the cross. They almost killed him. They didn't quite kill him. They put him in the, <laughs> in, in the cave, whatever. They put the stone there. The ETs come down. They remove the stone. They take him. They use modern medicine. They resuscitate him. Okay. They can now take him into the, into the flying saucer and they can go, you know, deliberately wanting time dilation effects so that Jesus can come back next week. Or maybe Jesus will come back in September, you know, according to, uh, you know, like what John Ramirez would say. Suppose Jesus, the actual historical Jesus Christ comes back. Here I am, guys. The flying saucer, he's, he's 34 years old, but 2,000 years ago. Boy. Yeah, that does not violate any physics. That's the point. So let me make a general point. By the way, I'm talking, I have some connections to my London club with people close to the Pope in the Vatican. Okay. And I'm trying to get this now to talk to these guys in the Vatican. I'm saying modern physics vindic it completely vindicates Catholic theology in many ways. All the miracles. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have to. Uh, there's no conflict between modern physics and, uh, let's say, the Catholic doctrine. I took a course in Thomas Aquinas at Cornell, you know, so I'm into, you know, kind of into that stuff. So, uh, in a way, Jack Sarfati is becoming defender of the faith. <laughs> because like, everything they say from immaculate conception, the, the Holy Trinity, all that kind of stuff can all be understood and uh, consistent with the laws of, of modern physics. You know, in other words, you don't have to believe uh, and reject your your reason, scientific method. Okay, so that now once they understand this, I think there's going to be some big uh, there'd be some big political or you know spiritual <laughs> change. But always remember, Jack. The, yeah. the Vatican helped the Nazis in the rat line to, to South America. Well, they, maybe they, they, they did, don't like you know? they don't like Jews. Yeah, but well, actually, they like actually that. That's a whole other story. Turns out my family's been involved with the Vatican for a couple of hundred years, but that's a different story. That's a, about. But you know what? Look, let's take let's take Joe Biden for example, or or any president it could be Trump. If you if you don't like it, you take Trump. You may not like a particular president, right? But we're supposed to hopefully respect the office itself. That's increasingly hard for us to do right now. But in the same way with the church, yeah, there've been abuses of the church and, and you know the pederasts, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, that's the failings of humans, but the institution should be beyond that. Although it's increasingly hard. Right, it's a, hard the Vatican is a city state along with Washington, D.C., which is military yes. and London for finance. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. I'm, I agree. I'm but nevertheless, so. I agree with you. But nevertheless, the fact of the matter is I'm purely from an intellectual, you know, from purely intellectual objective without getting involved in the, in, in the temporal politics. A lot of the things that are in the, and it's not just the Catholic the theology. There are a lot of things that are in theology can be reconciled with science. It's not like uh, with Galileo and the Vatican that there was a clash. It was only it was only a clash that they didn't know very much science, and people were pretty stupid then. Of course, we're, we're still pretty stupid. But right. my my response I, to that is, who cares? I mean, the Vatican right, science right. department is is an oxymoron. <laughs> Guys, Angel, if, if, angels if I, and demons. come on folks that's et angels yeah. demons gods and goddesses they're all ets i'm sorry of course exactly that's the whole point yes um guys if i yeah. could jump in it we're at the top of the hour yeah. and so jack i think you'd said that pippa isn't able to present um what would you like to do now sir yeah well you know what i think we've all pretty much pretty exhausted so <laughs> let's let's continue this tomorrow right here I am. I'm right now. Let's see. What time is it here? It's eight o'clock in Cortona. And uh, I think I'm going to walk down to the town square, get myself some spaghetti <laughs> and a glass of red wine. And I think we should continue. And, and she's not here, is she? Is people? Wait, is that? Is that is, no, Nancy is here. And hello, Nancy. Uh, so I, I say we just adjourn. huh? What do, what do you say? Same time tomorrow. Same Zoom channel. Uh, yeah.